welcome. And of course, uh, Sunday mornings, so we do Genesis. We go back, continue along where we left off last Sunday. Baruch Ata Adonai Eloheinu Melech Haolam Asher Kitshanu BeMitzvotav VeTzivanu LaAsoch BeDivrei Ora. Amen. Amen. Here it goes. Sharing the screen. So, just to catch us up a little bit, you can see my screen now. And uh, what has happened is the fall of man has taken place. The snake has seduced Eve into eating the, the tree of life, the fruit of the tree of life. She has shared it with her husband, and they have shared it with all the animals, according to our traditional interpretation. And this has happened. This has happened. And now they're aware that they are naked. They realize they're exposed. I will tell you that I've been giving some more thought to the metaphor of eating of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And I believe this is not necessarily original at all. And perhaps you've thought of it yourself, um, that it actually is a euphemism for sexual activity that it actually has to do with losing one's virginity and that that's eating from the tree of knowledge because the word uh, da'at in Hebrew can mean experience. And in fact, the word for having sexual intercourse, the word that is used in Hebrew is la he experienced Eve. That's the word that we use in Hebrew, at least in biblical Hebrew. So. Uh, at any rate, that's so. Uh, I'm pretty certain now and very comfortable with the idea of the tree of knowledge of good and evil is such a beautiful way of, of describing sexuality, human sexuality, and the actual act of copulation. So they now know, and they're hiding, they're hiding. Or they will be hiding. They made for themselves outfits, right, out of the fig leaves. And they heard the voice of God, Lord God, um, wandering, going in the garden at the, some say, breezy time of the day. But the truth is that the word ruach can also mean direction. So the direction of the day, and we'll see how Rashi gets onto that. And Vayitchave Adam Vishto, and the man and his wo his woman hid Mipne Hashem Elohim uh, from the presence of the Lord God, but Toch Eitz Hagan amidst the trees of the garden. So it but Toch Eitz Eitz is singular. So it could be in the midst of the tree of the garden, but I it's usually translated as plural in English at any rate. So, Rashi. By Yishma'u, they heard. <clears throat> and Rashi simply tells us, points to us, Yesh Midrashe Agada Rabim. He says there are many Midrashim about this particular verse. Ukfar Sidrum Rabotenu Al Mechonam. And he says, and our sages have arranged them in their defined places, the Bereshit Raba in Bereshit Raba. Uh, we are actually studying Bereshit Raba on Wednesday evenings. Uvesha'ar Midrashot and in other Midrashim. Ba'ani lo bati. However, I have only come ela lipshuto shel mikra to offer up the plain sense, the plain meaning of the text. Ula Agada, and to those Midrashim, right, those Agadot, Hamiya Shevet Divrei Hamikra, that and that Agada that settles the words of the of the text, the scriptural text, in other words, that, that gives us a better sense of the plain, simple, basic meaning of the text. Davar, and I think this is Dabur al Ofanav. He's, and again, this is the end of the sentence, which says that helps make sense of the text. 
Vayishma'u, they heard. Ma'ashamu, what did they hear? Shamu et kol hakadosh baruch hu. So this seems like a, you know, this he just seems to be saying what's said in the text. And, and for me, that's, of course, a difficulty because what new item is he telling us? But anyway, it says they heard the sound of the Holy One, blessed be he, Shahaya mitalech kagan, who was wandering in the garden. And I'm really not sure what is the point that Rashi is trying to make here. And it's quite possible that other interpreters of Rashi may be coming up with something here where he's adding to what the text is saying itself. So I'm looking back. Yeah, I mean, it just simply, simply seems to see saying exactly that. They heard the voice of a God. Mitalek of God. Right. So... But unless Shahaya means that that it that that what Rashi is telling us is that it wasn't just the sound, but that it was the divine presence itself, and that would be something new or a, a, a clarification that Rashi would be making for us. This additional word Shahaya, that God was wandering in the garden now i mean we'd have to speak more in terms of the divine presence the ruach hayom remember sometimes ruach means a wind of the day so the breezy time of the day but the truth is i think i'm comfortable with rashi's interpretation and he says Lo'oto ruach shehashemesh ba'amisham. so he says that is the same same direction where the sun comes, from where the sun comes. Now, there is a question as to the accuracy of this text. And in the square brackets, we have Sfarim Acherim. Other texts of Rashi say Lesham, not Misham, but Lesham. In other words, the place where the, the, the sun goes. And he says, Vedok, which in, in, in essentially means this is uh, QED, Kichen Ikar. He says that is the main meaning. So he, or the, or rather the, the better version of the text. So in other words, Vezohi, and this is Ma'aravit. In other words, the time of day when the sun was setting, Ma'aravit, evening. Shalif not Erev, because before evening, Hama Bamarav, the sun is in the western quadrant of the sky, the Hem Sarhu Baasirit. And what happened was the the moment when the the fall took place was in the tenth hour, which would be four o'clock in the uh, let's see, two o'clock in the uh, no, 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 four o'clock in the afternoon. Four o'clock in the afternoon. Six, six o'clock, 6 a.m. is uh, the first, six to seven is the first hour, etc. So you can figure it out. And, and there's a way in which they calculate that this is when it all happened. Next, Vayikra Hashem Elohim El Adam. And the Lord God called out to the man, Vayomer Lo. And he said to him, one second, just let me finish the sentence and then I'd be happy to take your question, David, or your point. He said to him, Ayeka, where are you? So God calls out to man and says, where are you? David, go for it. Yeah, what's what's the significance, though, of it happening at 4 p.m.? Maybe I, I missed that, <laughs> but or, or did we get right. that? No, no, we we didn't. We didn't. It's just that it wasn't at the beginning of the day. And I think, in fact, after it all happened, and remember, man had been told, they'd been told that they would die, right? That they would die when they ate from that tree of knowledge of good and evil. And it's possible that he thought that, the, you know, here the sun was setting. Remember, when were they created? When were when in what day of the week were Adam and Eve created? Uh, the I'm um, uh, six. I'm not sure if it was the fifth. Or... No, it was the sixth day. They were created sixth. on the sixth day. So yep. they were created yep. on that day, and on that very same day, they ate from the tree of knowledge of good and evil. 
And it's possible that Adam thought the, the world was coming to an end, right? That when it started to grow dark, Adam thought this is the end. We know that night and darkness is associated with death. Mm. And, and so I, I don't recollect, I may have read how they figured out that it was four o'clock in the afternoon, but, and with nightfall occurring at six o'clock, you should understand, uh, using rabbinic time. And um, that he actually is this midrash that I recollect where he thought that it was going to come to an end. And when the day dawned on the seventh day and he realized that the world wasn't coming to an end. And of course, what was that seventh day? It was the first Shabbat that any right. human being had experienced. And by the way, without question, Shabbat is supposed to be a little taste of immortality for us, that God is so kind to us that, that the rules of Shabbat and the, the cessation of labor is actually a way of experiencing immortality. So that he, that that's the significance of it happening is that he thought that he was going to end, that it was the end period and it turned out it wasn't. So that's, I mean, that's from our point of view and understanding the literary connection of 4 p.m. Because it was Thank you. for that to happen. So that's my, yeah, I mean, some of that I can say with certainty, some of that is a little bit of speculation on my part. Yeah, but it certainly makes a lot more sense, right? Yeah. Especially, okay, why the timing would be important based on what they thought was going to happen. So right. it may, thank you. And it could be, you know, there were a bunch of things that they did beforehand, you know, for example, naming all the animals and Adam trying to find a suitable helpmate, God performing the surgery to create Eve. I mean, all that stuff was happening, right? So, yeah. Okay. That's, and it could be that the way, it could be, this is a total speculation on my part, that in trying to, to line out and specify the various different things that happened, it works out to be, and say, an hour apiece or whatever, that it works out to be four o'clock in the afternoon. So uh, something like that. Could be. Could be. But we have this wonderful verse now where God calls out to Adam and says, where are you? Where are you? Ayeka. Your day, Ahaya. God knew. He knew where he was. God didn't have to ask him. He didn't need the information. But the reason why God said to him, where are you, was so as to begin a conversation. He want, and of course, that question, where are you, though, is such a fabulous question that we have to ask ourselves every day, where are we? Where are we? Spiritually, not just geographically. Where are we, America? Where are we, California? Where are we, Mordechai? Where are we, Mordechai's family, etc., cetera, etc.? Cetera. But why did God enter this conversation with him? Hello. Yeah, and by the way, of course, the context, remember, is that Adam and Eve were hiding in the tree. Remember, we just read they were hiding when they heard God. Right? They were hiding. Right. So. Shelo yehe nivhal, and the reason he wanted to start this conversation with Adam is so that he wouldn't be too scared, lahashiv, to be able to respond. Im yaani shehu pitom, if in fact God would punish him right away, suddenly. Right? I mean, he had just he'd done something wrong. He knew it was something wrong. God had warned him that it was something wrong. That this moment. Technically speaking, God could have said, okay, Adam, you just did that. This is what's happening. You know, you asked for it, you got it. But he didn't do that. He asked Adam to look into himself. And it's quite possible that God was hoping that Adam would say, I really messed up and I'm sorry. In other words, he gave, he gave Adam an opportunity to do tshuva. He gave him that opportunity. So anyway, 
um, but the point that Rashi's making is that this is a it's um, it's not a question for information. It is a question to get a conversation going. The Cain Bekain, and likewise, when Cain killed Abel, right? He did something that was wrong. Amarlo, God says to him, and this is in Genesis chapter 4, Hevel Achicha, he says to him, where's Abel, your brother? Look at the language, though. It isn't just, where is Abel? He says, where is Abel, your brother, whom he has just murdered? And likewise, later on, with Bilam, right? Bilam, who's off to curse curse um, the Jewish people, the Israelites, uh, against the will of God. And he knows that, right? God had told him, I believe at least once not to do it, not to go. And only he went, when he was asked a second time, then he went. And he said to God, you know, basically God says, okay, go, go, take the consequences. So God says to Bilam, Mi ha'anashim ha'ele imach, who are these people with you? And the reason is, bikanes imahim bidvarim so as to begin a conversation with them. And likewise, with King Hezekiah, when Merodach Baladan, who was king of Babylon, sent him emissaries. And that is a story that I wanted to share with you a little bit. Maybe actually give you a little bit of music. <clears throat> so I just thought I'd do a little bit different, something different. So we're going to go into, I'm going to see if I can do this into a new share. Let's see if this is it. I think this is the place. Let's see. Yes, uh, this is not the place. But let me go back to where we are because you can follow me. Uh, forgive me, there was a couple of places. Uh, sorry, Let's, here we go. Isaiah 39, let me pull that in. Here we go. So this is the story, right? So back, a little backstory. Hezekiah got very sick, and um, I believe he did tshuva, and at that, at that point, uh, he was healed. God gave him that opportunity. And here's how it goes on in Isaiah. At that time, Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, the king of Babylon, you know, da 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 da, sent envoys with a letter and a gift to Hezekiah, for he had heard about his illness and recovery. Hezekiah was pleased by their coming, and he showed them his treasure house, the silver, the gold, the spices, and the fragrant oil. This might be some reference to the temple here, and all his armory and everything that was to be found in his storehouses. There was nothing in his palace or in all his realm that Hezekiah did not show them. Then the prophet Isaiah came to King Hezekiah. By the way, Hezekiah was not a bad guy, okay, basically, but messed up. What? This is Isaiah saying, he demanded of him, did those men say to you? Well, Isaiah knew what they said. All right, he knew about what happened, but he's saying this. Where have they come to you from? And he knew that too. They have come to me, replied Hezekiah, from a car far country from Babylon. Next, he, Isaiah, asked, what have they seen in your palace? And Hezekiah replied, they have seen everything there is in my palace. There was nothing in my storehouses that I did not show them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, Hear the word of God of hosts. A time is coming when everything in your palace, which your ancestors have stored up to this day, will be carried off to Babylon. Nothing will be left behind, said God. And some of your sons, your own issue, whom you will have fathered, will be taken to serve as eunuchs in the palace of the king of Babylon. And here's Hezekiah's response. Hezekiah declared to Isaiah, the word of God that you have spoken is good. 
Well, he thought it means that safety is assured for my time because he said some of your sons to him. <sighs> you know, being seduced by a gift and overly, you know, too much information, right? There's a gorgeous example of that. And here's, and this is the opening passages from Belshazzar's feast. And I'm going to have to find that for you. Give me a moment, because I have that. One moment here. By the way, does that make Hezekiah the like the first narcissist, or because that's almost what it sounds like? Oh gosh, I doubt if he's the first one. Please forgive. But it, me. I'm going to stop. But it sounds like, but but I mean, that's the behavior, right? You know, every yeah. Anyway, we'll go back after. Anyway. Second, I'm going to do this again. I there was a piece that I forgot to do. Let's try it again. Here goes. Thank you, David. I'm so glad you stopped me. I'm going to go back to that original I original share. Let's see if I can find it there. Okay. Yeah, there are a couple of buttons I failed to press. Anyway, just a really memorable little selection of that beautiful piece that William Walton wrote in Modern Idiom. Gorgeous. So just how he took the words of the Bible and just gave them some musical setting. And it's just lovely. I hope you enjoyed it. All right, so this is, we'll take just one more verse. By Yomer, and this is Adam responding, et kolcha shamati, I heard your voice, bagan in the garden, ira, and I was frightened, ki erom anochi, because I am naked, v'achave, and I hid it. So let's take a look. So there's no Rashi on this. We are going to have to stop here at this very dramatic moment because the truth is, of course, Adam has just admitted his guilt. But you'll see how he keeps trying to get out of it, trying to rationalize his behavior, which is amazing and uh, beautifully illustrative of human behavior to this very day. David, do you have another question? Or yeah, so I'm, I'm almost wondering in this whole thing, you know, given that if, if I understand correctly, you know, this all kind of takes place in one day, right? All this is activity is happening on the sixth day. Right. So given what you said earlier, does it also really mean that Adam and Eve go from, you know, they they go from being children to adults. I mean, literally, are they going through those stages? Because Adam's behavior is almost like that of a child, right? I mean, I, I'm just, just asking that. David, I believe they were formed as adults. Okay. I believe that. And the truth is, I have seen, and I've been tempted myself. And sometimes, of course, I have, I've had to try and train myself not to do this. But there are so many times when you hear adults doing the same kind of thing. Yeah, yeah. I, I guess my but, my right. right. It, but it almost seems like their yeah their their physical state may be formed as adults, but their mental state sounds like they they start as as children, right? In in some I don't know. That's yeah. Anyway, I don't know if that's any has anything to do with it. Perhaps not. I think it does, and I think what I I just recently, very recently 
drew a conclusion that when people act in this particular way, and including when they act out of anger, they have they are acting as children. That that kind of behavior is childish behavior. And sadly, it's a commentary on someone who has not been able to transition to adulthood. Because when you're an adult, you look at the truth, you try to discover the truth in the process of childhood. And when you're accused of something, you look at the truth of it, and you don't try to run away from it. And you try to develop courage. It's important. You know, if, if, if I want to treat a child and teach a child, teach a child to lie, every time they admit, if they ever admit they've done something wrong, I scream at them and teach and treat them badly. But on the other hand, if they've done something wrong and I see it as a learning opportunity and, and even if there's a consequence, try to speak to them, you know, in a quiet and loving way so that they can, they don't have to bear the brunt of my emotional, uh, you know, anger response, but keep, you know, be mean, be angry to a child when they're willing to admit they did something wrong and you will teach them how to lie. Mm, yeah, very true. Thank you. Okay. So I'm really glad you brought that up. And with that, I am going to stop the recording.